which we have a, a particularly strong panel of speakers. Uh, my name's Jonathan Adams. Um, I work for Digital Science, uh, which is part of Macmillan. And uh, we have a contract at the moment from the Higher Education Funding Council. Um, so I'm declaring an interest in one of the speakers um, to uh, create a database of the 6,900 uh, impact case studies which universities have submitted to the uh, research excellence framework. Um, and they represent a quite extraordinary cornucopia of information about the wider impact of academic research on uh, the economy and society. So to some extent, the, the question of should in the title of this session is already answered because we do. Um, and David, we talking about that. But I just wanted to start off by saying I have read 6,680 um, of the case studies um, in the last few weeks, either in whole or in part. And I find it difficult to see and identify any of those case studies that do not have, to a greater or lesser extent, some social impact. Um, and I am sure that uh, uh, Phil Campbell and Jane Tinker will be able to comment on that from their perspectives at uh, much greater and more informed length than I could. But let me first of all introduce David Sweeney, who will be familiar to many of you. Uh, he has been deeply instrumental in uh, driving research policy at the Funding Council and driving the development of the structure which we now see in the Research Excellence Framework and which pays such close attention as it does now to these other non uh, academic aspects of the impact of, of the research which is funded. David. Thanks very much. Thanks, Jonathan. It's my pleasure to be here, uh, to be among so many friends, uh, and it was fantastic to see John on the, the panel in the previous, uh, in the previous session. Uh, I've written the number down, 13,000, 13,000, 970 days ago, I commenced my working life. Every one of those 13,970 days has been spent either doing research, uh, supporting research, I was a, a statistician, uh, managing research, because I was a pro vice chancellor of the university, uh, funding now, and assessing research. Every one of those days has been about research. So I hope I can answer the question, what is it? The question that really I struggle with after 13,970 days, 8,000 of them uh, with John, is why do we do it? Why do we do it? Now, uh, of course, I've got some answers, but I think this is a question that we all need to ponder and consider. Uh, if we are, as I have done, uh, committed a working life to it, you want to do things that matter. As to what it is, we have definitions. We have a Frascati definition, uh, the, the, the definition we use in the research uh, in the Higher Education Funding Council and the REF, uh, the Research Excellence Framework, is a process of investigation leading to new insights uh, and uh, with a nod to Cameron, effectively shared on the grounds that new insights that you don't share aren't worth uh, having a process of investigation leading to new insights effectively shared. Uh, why do we do it? That's the question. Will the, bit, the Royal Society have an answer? Uh, this is uh, one of their big documents. No one can predict the 21st century counterparts of quantum theory, the double helix, and the internet, but there is little doubt that advances in science and technology will continue to transform the way we live create new industries and jobs, and enable us to tackle seemingly intractable social and environmental problems. And if I've been working for those 13,000 days, if I contribute in any small way at all to those things, I think I'd feel quite happy. I like that statement. It is, you will notice, about understanding and about impact. 
Uh, the British Academy have got a similar statement, uh, this quest for a better, deeper, more valuable life uh, impact. And it goes on, of course, to talk about uh, understanding how economies, cultures, and societies uh, function. Very important things. Uh, research is about understanding and about impact, would be my uh, contention. Uh, can I just say, I think we are uh, intellectual, intellectual cream of the country researchers. You are. You are doing a great job. I hope we can cope with multiple reasons for doing something. So when the Vice Chancellor says, as he did to his staff recently in his annual uh, oration, uh, we believe in the pursuit of knowledge for its own sake. I want to hug him and say, yes, that doesn't mean to say you shouldn't pursue knowledge for other purposes than just its own sake. Uh, and different people will have different reasons for doing things, and I'd encourage you all to have your own uh, reasons for doing that. But it's not just a question for us. As researchers, we don't own what we do. We are not a closed community. Uh, for, I'm afraid, the pretty functional purpose that uh, the public purse, the taxpayer, uh, pays for quite a lot of what we do, but also because understanding that it's just for a closed community, which I think is dangerous apart from anything else, but certainly, uh, surely, not what we devoted our lives to, understanding uh, for the benefit of the world, I would like to think, is what we do. And if it's for the benefit of the world, the world has a state and we've got to engage with it. And it won't take you long. Indeed, today's press, I always like it when today's press bears your argument out. Uh, Anne Glover, the chief scientific advisor of the European community, effectively sacked because she was willing to challenge in public with evidence from science uh, popular opinion about GM. Uh, without getting into that, quite clearly the scientists have to engage with the public on that territory. And I'm afraid if that results in uh, attack, uh, we've got to stand by what we believe. So what about taking decisions about research? How do we know we're doing it well? Because I think we all want to do things well. We've got to take that decision in science and research as a global enterprise, not as a local enterprise. Uh, we've got to take those decisions knowing that the cost of what we do is, is high and the resources constrain what we'd like to do, or at least I certainly like to do an awful lot more research, uh, but uh, our funding is limited. Uh, how do we know we're doing it well in an environment where, and I, I can see no way of getting around this, competition is part of the fabric. The prizes in science are mostly for coming first. Uh, Phil isn't tempted to print too many people papers from people who are the 20th or the 30th to confirm some fact. Is that right, Phil? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so competition, I, there, are, there are, I think, there's recognition for being second and third sometimes to, uh, to, uh, to confirm uh, difficult material. It's important that we can reproduce results, but competition is part of the, the fabric. So how do we know we're doing it well? Uh, and who should decide we're doing it well, I think, is, is a question. And again, quite clear in some areas of science, uh, we've ended up in a position we'd rather not be, perhaps because we weren't sufficiently informed by outsiders' views of what we do. So who should decide that we're doing it well? In my view, certainly something that was in the academy we've got to take responsibility for, but in my view, it's a shared responsibility in some way with the public. So if we know how we're doing it well, and I'm for the moment ducking that question, uh, and we agree that in some way it's a collective decision to decide whether we're doing it well. What should we do with the information that we're doing it well? Now, uh, we have uh, around the world a global consensus that investing in success is the way forward. Whether well, that's done uh, by approving the grants that we think uh, will uh, produce research into new areas and move us forward, whether it's rewarding the universities who provide 
uh, through their um, uh, researchers as employees at funding. Uh, we believe in rewarding those who do well, Nobel Prizes reward those uh, who came first and did something very significant. So uh, given that we're in a resource constrained world, uh, for me, one of the reasons uh, for looking at who has done well is that we use that to invest for future success. Uh, and of course, the Royal Society, uh, that future success, I just remind you, is in impact as well as in uh, understanding of uh, basic uh, stuff about our world and about the people who live in our world. So, and here we take the jump. If we're investing on the basis of doing well, and we're involving others, and our objectives are those, it seems to me we've got to make, if we want uh, to do it as well as possible, we've got to make some kind of assessment of the impact of our research to sit alongside our, in, our, under, our assessment of basic understanding. Uh, just a definition of impact there. In fact, there's two. One actually comes from Australia, the top one. The second one comes uh, from us. Uh, they're the, essentially the same definition. So any effect on change or benefit to the economy, society, culture, public policy or services, health, the environment, or quality of life beyond academia. We shut a lot of people away in dark rooms and wouldn't let them out till they gave us a, de de a definition that we thought was all encompassing. And when people say our definition is not broad enough, which they have, I plead with them to tell us where because uh, we've tried hard and we'll do better next time. So if we're looking at impact, uh, we would go from social impact to all of those things. Uh, some people, of course, say, but you really only believe in economic impact. Uh, we don't. I don't know if Jonathan will be able to tell us, because he's actually had far more case studies than me, if indeed there are case studies that go beyond economic impact. Many. Many. That's the right answer. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, it's what we said would happen. Of course it's what's happened. Uh, so much of what we do well, may have some economic outcomes are not primarily about making money. So that's good. So why, why do I think we should do it? Uh, because I think we've got to make the impact of our research explicit to the government and, as I've already suggested, to wider society, to the government, quite simply because the government takes funding decisions. It decides, will we put money into hospitals, into social care, uh, into transport, or into research? Uh, and there's no point in ducking the fact that politicians take that decision. Uh, they take it on the basis of evidence. It's our, well, partly on the basis of evidence. Uh, they've got to, uh, I think, have the benefit of the best possible evidence we can provide. I don't see how we provide that evidence without evidence of social impact. Lots and lots of researchers are, are involved in explicitly in research that is intended to be applied, intended uh, to make a difference, not intended to tackle basic understanding. I do not believe in making any distinction between different kinds of research. To me, people who are trying to solve today's practical problems are as important as those who are trying to understand the way the world works. We need both. We should recognize both. And in as much as funding drives this, we should reward both. Uh, universities are influential institutions in their societies and in the world. Uh, I want to encourage them to, as it says there, achieve the full potential contribution of their research uh, to the world in the future. And of course, universities have always been established in order to transform lives and to transform societies, most notably with the big civic universities in the 19th century. Uh, so we have challenged people to do that as part of a broader research assessment system. The old research assessment exercise became the research uh, excellence framework. I have claimed, perhaps boldly, that universities and academics have been galvanized, uh, not actually due to the importance of the ref, I didn't mean that so much, as due to the importance of this research impact being considered for the first time. Now, Jane, uh, who runs the most amazing blog at the London School of Economics, her and colleagues do, the most amazing uh, blog that describes the impact of the social sciences, uh, she can comment on whether I'm being slightly 
uh, over the top in saying that universities and academics have been galvanized. I think attitudes have been changed and uh, it's for the good. We have those case studies. Jonathan, why haven't you read the rest? <laughs> because they were redacted. Ah, now that's a good that's a good answer. Thank you. There were some case studies regarding national security or uh, uh, important commercial stuff which were redacted. How many have you read? Six thousand six hundred eighty. Six thousand six hundred and eighty. So that's about three hundred that have been redacted. That sounds a pretty good uh, number to me. Uh, many of these case studies, I've said, Jonathan can, uh, can confirm, are focused on the long-term contribution of research to society. I believe by reading those, and Jonathan's work will help us all do that, we'll understand much better the way in which impact arises from the breakthroughs we make in knowledge. Uh, so research assessment is not just about awarding money, it's about deploy, uh, gathering material and evidence that will help us understand better what we are doing and the difference it makes to the world. It's important that we offer every discipline the opportunity to make its case in its own terms. Jonathan and I have an argument that's running at the moment. I believe that we should only be assessing impact in drama from one university against impact in drama in another, that we yet lack a philosophical framework to compare impact in drama with impact in physics. Uh, and I'd like to see us collectively develop that framework. I don't believe it's there now. And of course, a lot of the work we do doesn't fit in the narrow disciplinary framework, which still predominates in universities. Impact, almost by definition, doesn't come just from physics or drama. It comes from the cross-fertilization of ideas, and it's therefore important that we offer every opportunity for that to happen. So to finish, uh, why do we do it? Uh, because we want to understand better uh, what research is for, and what the outcomes are, and we want uh, to use that evidence to invest for future success. I think if you don't take into account the outcomes of your work, you're depriving yourself of the evidence to persuade the government, but more particularly the world, that what we do is indeed the peak of human achievement, actually, intellectually. It's what our future society depends on. Uh, if we are, to believe that what we do, it transforms both lives and the world, we've got to demonstrate that. Looking at social impact does precisely that. Thank you. Well, that was a very crisp presentation again, and that's, that's great because that will give us more time for Q&A later on. Um, and if I can just add one thing, to what David was saying. It's not, I think, just that the, 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 these case studies demonstrate the peak of what's, what's being achieved. It's also the, the, the extraordinary pervasiveness that, that, that in reading through a lot of case studies, it becomes clear that, 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 that the outcomes of research run everywhere. And, and it, it, it's deep, deep uh, networks of penetration through, through, throughout society. But, but it's uh, now Phil Campbell, the uh, Editor-in-Chief of Nature, um, to follow up David and talk about um, his perspective on social impact of research. Thank you. So, um, the impact of nature papers, everybody knows about citations, everybody complains about the use of impact factor, etc., etc., and those are all legitimate sorts of questions to address, I like to ask my biology and physical sciences editors at the end of the year, at the end of a, a year after the year in which papers were published, which of the real low citation papers, of which we publish plenty, um, do they really value having published? And you know, there are plenty of gems amongst the low citations, because often really good research is a textbook case which you can't just replicate in the lab easily, and you've really done something nevertheless very valuable. So, even the academic impact is, is not, is, is nuanced. It's something that needs careful attention and you can't be simplistic. Um, the social impact, to assess it requires a sort of qualitative judgment often. You can't be quantitative about it, I would suggest. And if you look at the impact statements, I've looked at a tiny handful compared to what Jonathan has looked at, 
Um, it's clear that they're very qualitative in many ways. And if I think about how I get the front half team of Nature, the magazine content part of Nature, the news section and the comment section to assess their impact, all they can do is to look retrospectively back, let's say three months later or six months later and contact, contact the authors who they contacted, who they commissioned, contact the people who they wrote about and say, what difference did this make in your world? And you get back qualitative statements, you get back case studies, you get back people saying things like, because of this, one research agency discovered that they were actually competing where they should be collaborating, and so they changed the agreement they had. Another uh, funding agency issued this article to all their staff and said, you've got to do the following as a result of this, et cetera, et cetera. So there are these sorts of qualitative things that have an impact. And that's the world you're getting into, which is subjective and not very easy to do if you're trying to measure social impact. And yet it's incredibly valuable, and I totally, totally um, value what I've seen in these case studies. So to, now to move on to the REF, just to give a few examples, yes, there are case studies from a university about spin-off companies, as you'd expect. So the evidence for economic impact, at least in the early stages of product development, are there, I'm sure, in, ab in abundance. But also there are things like changes in um, clinical care methodology um, for heart failure is another example I saw. And it wasn't just in Britain, it was um, wi widespread around the world. Another case was um, the uh, influence on Afghanistan music training, right? Not the sort of thing you necessarily predict in a grant, something that has its value. So, so these are a very strange and motley group of impacts that you've got there. And yet, the ones I saw, you're, you're actually pleased to see them there, and it's good to capture them. And why is it good to capture them in the grand political sense? It is because, as is being reflected by the Global Research Council in its annual meeting, that's a gathering of funding agencies of the world, as is clear when you get a gathering of chief scientific advisors, which happened uh, internationally in New Zealand earlier this year, that they're all stating how much more intent governments are at seeing the social value, the social return of the funding that they're putting out into the science community, while not forgetting the intellectual and the cultural value of that research. So what are the societal agendas that one might want to face? So I think about this not just as nature, but in, as, chief, uh, as chief editor of the company, the publishing company. So we have put together the social sciences and the natural sciences parts of our company. We have the Palgrave brand of uh, social sciences journals and monographs, and, uh, which are researcher oriented. And we have the nature brand of all the journals that we publish under nature. And you can see already in Nature Climate Change, which is a thematic journal, that you have social science content alongside natural sciences content. They don't always join up, they don't necessarily synergize, but they're at least running there alongside each other. And you can imagine in the future, in publishing generally, as these multidisciplinary agendas take place, that there will be a need for more such multidisciplinary venues, whether they're the nature brand or the science brand or other brands. Um, that, that is in just an inevitable way, way forward. Um, so if you look at the societal agendas in which that should be happening without any question, you come to the well-established agendas of sustainability and health. And what is interesting to me as a, a scientific editor um, is that in many of those cases, you're talking about incremental science that is of real social value. So if you take healthcare and you take healthcare implementation science, and you start looking at why existing therapies work better in some environments than in others, and how do you investigate that, you're looking at anthropology. You look at why the communities in San Francisco who have AIDS, or the communities in Uganda who have AIDS, how do you deal with the societal issues that are making it more or less easy to treat those people with existing proven therapies? And that's a research project. It is, you do random trials, and it's difficult, in fact, and there are ethical issues in there. But that is, in fact, stuff that doesn't get into nature necessarily, and yet is of societal value. So you could have a sense in which nature should change its criteria, but you could get away with your, from your obsession with nature brands and other brands and just say, no, no, this is stuff that needs to be made visible not only in the academic literature, but also in the impact locations, in the policy statements that come out, in the policy records that come out, in the grey literatures that are out there. It's all out there probably, but it's often deeply hidden. It's often locked away in the vaults, as it were, of the funding agency's annual reports. 
How, so there is a real challenge if we're really going to see this societal impact agenda through for the researchers <coughs> and the funders and the journals or the publishers, let's say, because it's not necessarily academic journal publishing we're talking about here, to be more adventurous and imaginative in thinking about how to capture the impacts of these things. So other examples you can give are, for example, mental health. So psychological treatments research is stuff that doesn't have the prestige or the high impact journal presence that basic neuroscience has. But basic neuroscience, in, for the main part, isn't going to make a difference to anyone's life if they have a mental illness for years or decades at least. So th there is a real challenge there that is really real in terms of why people out there want to see all this money going into science if it's not actually going to help them. But neuroscience is wonderful. There is no, no question that the technological issues, the technological advances that are happening in, in connectomics, in optogenetics and so on, are really making a difference at our tractability in brain matter. But how you relate that to psychology, let alone to behavior, let alone family relationships, is a really challenging thing. And we're nowhere near bringing, making those connections. But there are pieces of social research, there are pieces of psychological research, and there are pieces of clinical research which all relate at that level and are making a difference to people's lives. So how do you make that more visible? And to me, the key question actually is how do you make useful research prestigious? So is it necessary to publish in an academic journal at all for useful research, for these case study research case studies as such, to be prestigious? Can you make case studies an item of academic publishing in the future? Harvard Business Review does that all the time. So how can you make that something that is documented and given prestige by learned academies? So that's the sort of issue I think we're getting into. I think the multidisciplinarity of these problems is something we all understand to be difficult and challenging. Funders, I think, need to give more time for multidisciplinary projects to really take root because often you don't even understand the questions if you're bringing three disciplines together unless you've spent time in those disciplines investigating the questions before we even frame what the question is. The question of dissemination I've already talked about, so not just academic, what other sorts of dissemination could really make a difference, both to the visibility and the impact, indeed, of the research that has already made something of an impact. The prestige question is a real one, and ultimately there is an open access question here, because if you're looking at making this stuff visible and disseminating it, in the end, there is no one who's going to pay for that necessarily, I don't think, unless they are the funder of the research. So yes, a journal article is a natural outcome. It is an inevitable outcome, one hopes, of a piece of funded research. And there is a real case for that being seen as a job of the funder to help disseminate that in a journal. But when it comes to this sort of societal impact, maybe the uh, uh, open access agenda goes further than that and actually says we as the funders have to also include the dissemination of the great literature, giving it some sort of a stamp of our own approval that we really do see this as a valid outcome of our funding and therefore giving it a little bit of prestige. Those are the sorts of issues I think are out there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Phil. And the, um, the issue of, 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 of outcomes um, in terms of, of those, those, those impacts of research and the question of, of, of publication uh, reminds me also of the mode one, mode two argument from Mike Gibbons and Peter Scott um, in the, the 90s, that, that actually the, the, the impact of much of this research is when the research users are much more closely engaged in the research process itself. And so that publication, the arrival on the library shelf, as it were, and then the, 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 the use of the, the, the research outcomes is, is bypassed because the, the, that, that, that social or political or environmental impact is, is much more immediate. And that's a problem we still haven't fully overcome. Um, our third speaker, uh, Jane Tinker, has uh, already been referred to <laughs> nice um, in, in a very positive way uh, by the Funding Council, um, Jane. Uh, from the London School of Economics, who's in an excellent position to talk about social impact of research. Hi. Um, it was interesting to me that the, the title of this panel seemed to still need a, a question, a, a justification as to why we might think about um, academic work having social impact. Um, now, I mean, I, I'm, I'm sort of biased in this. I have spent the last four years um, 
researching uh, academic impact and uh, as David very kindly mentioned so I'm part of a team at the London School of Economics um, that has um, been working on the impact of social science project so you know I, I'm kind of biased about this but we've actually all just spent an inordinate amount of time um, thinking about impact all of us uh, researchers academics universities because we've just gone through the first ref um, process and I think galvanized is quite a good word and um, we've been galvanized by the ref I mean I think possibly some academics could also think of other words um, <laughs> obsessed you know destroyed but I don't know um, but uh, you know I think uh, there, there really has been a, a sort of a buy-in uh, to the to impact um, by um, uh, UK academia and and in a way I kind of think this question is is answered the case for that academic work um, should have social impact and does absolutely uh, feels to me um, quite quite answered. Uh, so actually, I'm, I'm not really going to focus too much on that here. What I want to talk about is why um, impact is actually good for academics, for us as researchers and academics. Um, I think that impact has been an incredibly useful mm. lens to look at actually what we do as academics and researchers. And I think it lets us look at this in, in four different ways. So firstly, I think it helps us look at how we research and um, the type of things that we do when we research. Um, Ernest Boyer, in his 1990 book, Scholarship Reconsidered, highlighted four functions of scholars and, and research, um, which were discovery, integration, application, and renewal. And for some people, um, the, the model of impact that we use um, in the REF is a little bit too focused on the first of those, on the discovery um, scholarship task. Um, and that is something that's seen as more common in the science subjects than in, in my discipline group in the, in the social sciences. Um, for us, the roles of integration and application are actually equally important and they really are when we're talking about impact. So integration um, scholarship is around defining theory, pooling ideas, creating work that um, is uh, review articles or overviews to draw in a number of different um, theories and points of view in one place, writing textbooks that help us teach the next generation of scholars, and also then translate that work out into those uh, engaging with external users and engaging with the public um, about the work that, that we're doing. And then application scholarship then um, takes all that research, that knowledge, those findings and helps to um, make it useful for those outside universities. So by creating tools, by creating data sets, um, pulling together um, explainers and, and those kind of um, really accessible pieces by academics acting as um, experts on government or business um, boards, um, by providing executive training and by providing directly commissioned research um, for government, for business, for civil society. And really all applied and impactful academic knowledge must be sort of translated in this way from the single discipline silos that we tend to work in in academia it needs to be bridged and integrated with all of the sort of answers that are coming out from um, different disciplines and it needs to be pulled together in a, into a sort of joined up picture so it can really answer real world situations um, outside universities and impact, I think, allows us to think about these roles, the roles that, um, that we take on and, and the things that we're trying to do with our scholarship. They help us think about how these fit together. And it does help us think about how research is, is assessed and rewarded in the system in which we work. Um, one very positive thing that a lot of our interviewees told us about the REF were they were undertaking all these impact activities already, but they weren't really getting credit for them. Whereas as the ref came in, suddenly they were the golden children because they had an impact case study ready, ready to go. And as um, David had mentioned, something else that the impact kind of lens um, highlights is the value in the role that interdisciplinary work plays at looking at um, key social challenges. Um, and 
it does that in a way that uh, many academics feel traditional assessment methods don't, uh, that um, interdisciplinary work is incredibly hard to, um, to assess if you're thinking about in a very formal academic senses. Um, in our work, we found that research that was multi-authored, that was interdisciplinary, was much more likely to have social impact than um, research that did not have those characteristics. And we know from talking to, for example, policymakers, that they're particularly frustrated by the siloed nature of academic work. They really want to hear joined up research and joined up solutions to problems which interdisciplinary work gives them. And the push for impact also entails opening up how we research in terms of involving new partners and finding new ways to co-produce research um, with those who then may go on and use that research as part of their own work. So the second thing impact helps us to think about is what we publish and how we publish. So we have a, a particular set of outputs that we tend to produce as academics um, that vary slightly across the disciplines, but not really very much. Um, and there's, there's a clash, there's a mismatch here in terms of the, the journal articles or the books that we need to produce as a way to get reward, um, get promoted within academia, um, and the outputs that, that the, if we're trying to have impact, we might want to produce in order for them to, to reach further outside universities. So a big survey uh, that uh, colleagues at Manchester University did with senior civil servants found um, very few of them referring to journal articles as a way to access academic research. Um, they were seen as quite jargon heavy, uh, quite long, um, and actually they were very hard to get because uh, most of the um, civil service didn't have subscription to, to those journals. So how do we resolve this clash? Because for any societal research to be used by um, public or, or other organisations, it must both be um, excellent research, it must capture those key features of a situation and, and think about how behaviours might change as, as a result, um, but it also must be timely, it must be produced speedily and it must be accessible to those who use it. So this makes us think about what we publish and the formats in which we do that. Um, and a, a really key question for us during our research was, um, can you do both? Can you publish in a very sort of traditional way, producing your journal articles that you need to, um, but also can you try and talk to those outside universities in different ways using different formats? And um, hopefully you'll be happy to hear that yes, you can do both. Uh, we looked at a big data set of um, uh, 350 academics as part of our research and we tracked their publications, but also their external mentions, so how regularly they were talked about by those outside universities. And we found a really strong core of academics that were, were doing both, that they were able to, to both publish um, in traditional academic ways, but also in impactful ways. And when we talked to those academics, they really didn't see a clash here. They found that both of those things were constituent to each other and actually mutually reinforcing. So the quality of the research was improved by um, engaging with external people and having to think about how you might change the way that you publish something um, in order to talk to them more directly. And that then, again, fed back into more excellent research. So thirdly, how do we communicate our research is really uh, influenced by if we're thinking about trying to have impact um, and looking at the tools, for example, we use to communicate research, as David very kindly mentioned, uh, the team that I'm based in at the LSE now run six actually academic blogs. And this came directly out of our research on, on academic impact because it's really, it, well, this is now four years ago, it was really clear how um, invisible a lot of academic research was. And we wanted to try and utilize some of the digital tools available to us in order to make um, academic research more visible. Um, and we found there was a real appetite um, for these kind of short form accessible um, academic pieces of work, um, commentary, expertise, opinion, and, um, Across our blogs now, we reach about 100,000 people a week. 
Um, you know, so those are fairly hefty numbers of people who are interested in reading and engaging with academic research um, that may then go on and have impact. Um, and I don't think um, we would have had as much support. I don't think we'd have had as much financial support um, to create those tools, to use those platforms, if we hadn't all been trying to create um, a, a impact um, as driven by, by the REF process. And lastly, I think impact helps us think about how our work is translated and used um, outside academia. So um, we know that um, advances and insights need to be communicated and transferred to, um, to those outside universities. Um, and we know that some of that work is not done by us as academics. It's done by people within government, within businesses, um, in think tanks, it's done by journalists. And this can be quite um, an uncomfortable position for us as researchers to sort of push our research out and then have people do things to it. Um, but actually, our research showed quite how vital that is as part of a research dissemination cycle. Um, and we know that there's uh, a section uh, that we called the mediating middle which are all the organisations that are involved in translating academic research out to those who might um, use it. And we also found that that mediating middle for the science subjects is much larger than in the social science. So there's, there's um, more organisations that are involved in, in it and they are better resourced and, and better funded. So it's interesting for us to think about how academics might take some more control of that, how we might um, think about how our work is translated a bit more clearly. And again, I think we wouldn't really be thinking so much about these issues if, if we hadn't had this push from, from the REF and from the impact agenda. The last point um, I wanted to make on, on the blurb, it sort of said, how do we give credit for social impact? Uh, and uh, I don't mean to be flippant on this, but I think we give credit by giving credit. Um, this is something that is absolutely part of being an academic, engaging and trying to um, create value from the work that we do. And supporting that within the universities is something that we need to get a bit better at. Um, so we need to ensure that impact activities are part of review and promotion criteria, that it's not quite so you're having to choose either I'm going to publish this journal article or I'm going to try and do something impactful. It can't be that uh, quite uh, so split is that. We need to do more training and guidance with PhD students and early career researchers around um, when you might try and have some impact with your research and when you really need to ignore impact entirely and, and keep doing the research that you're doing. Um, and universities need to think about the tools that they use to communicate um, research with them, think about digital platforms um, such as blogs and a whole host of other things. And I think, you know, we're, we're all now focusing on the um, outcome of this REF and it will be really interesting um, to read those case studies and see all of the, the stories that those outline, but also then to see how we as academics and universities can use the learning from those case studies to feed back in um, so that we um, have even more brilliant stories to tell in REF 2020. In the, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Jane. Um, a, a wide coverage there. We do still have a little time left for questions and answers. Um, so do we have our roving microphones still? Um, so there's there's a, a lot of material to uh, cover here, but let me try to start with a question there. Yes. Hello, Charlie Rappel from QDOS. Um, really interesting session, thank you. I think a lot of us on Twitter saying best one of the day, which is not <laughs> to malign all the others, but good to keep our attention right to the end. Um, really good points about the ref and the way it has changed attitudes in the uk what's your perception of where we are in relation to the rest of the world are we leading the way being galvanized by impact are other countries further advanced than us in this respect i think it's always been clear to me that the intensely good work of the higher education funding council has led the way globally for 
many decades. Is that your impression as well, David? <laughs> well, I, right, let's be straight and honest. The first people who were into this kind of uh, assessment of research impact were the Australians, who developed a system, uh, huge elements of which we're using, but they never actually implemented it. Uh, and uh, they then uh, took having worked with us, uh, our methodology, which was built on theirs, and they did their own pilot in a slightly different way because they looked at sectoral impacts rather than discipline-based impacts. I think that was fascinating and will give us cause for concern. I think there are many others looking at different methods of assessing uh, research impact. Uh, primarily, I've got to say, uh, through metrics, which I'm not uh, so enthusiastic about, research impact. I think in terms of doing the kind of ex uh, exercise we're doing, we are, we are uh, certainly setting uh, something for others to look at and critique, and in some cases, learn from. And I'm all for it because it's given me the great opportunity to travel to other countries uh, with Phil in the, and, uh, and talk about it. So I think we're trying it. Others are, are looking that everybody faces a common problem in a time of tightening times financially, how do you get uh, the most bang for your buck? Everybody also faces the challenge of how do we continue to invest in research that gives us that underpinning basic knowledge as well as uh, investing in impact. I'd just like to pick up one of David Cahoon's comments on Twitter in response. <laughs> Has he been getting stick today? No, no. David Cahoon, uh, he says, uh, what is the impact of his 1982 Royal Society paper on the stochastic properties of bursts of single ion uh, channel openings and so on and so on? I, well, I, I think it has been cited. It clearly made a difference academically. But he then suggests is it worthless because it doesn't have research impact? Of course it's not worthless. We are not in the game of insisting that everyone has impact. We're in the business of encouraging all kinds of research some of that basic research will lead to impacts down the line. Some will just advance our understanding. And remembering that research is a risky game, some of it won't work. And we've got to accept we're investing for success. We have to put up with failure as well, because that will be the challenge in always uh, being successful. So I say to David, uh, who also says, by the way, the problem, <laughs> the problem of solo 14 is that it consists largely of non or ex scientists telling us what we should do. David, if you're still listening, first of all, what we want to do is talk with you, not tell you what to do. And I would encourage you to welcome that discussion because I think it would be fruitful for us. I'd like to think it would be fruitful for you. I'm not in the game of telling scientists what to do. I think I am in the game of saying, we want you to do world leading research that gives us basic knowledge. We also want you to do work that transforms society. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. David Cahoon's <laughs> Improbable Science. Read it. You can yes. disagree with him and you can benefit from his insights. Go and read it. I'm sure he, he would also remind us that, that actually people who get it horribly wrong can be impactful as well. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and, but Phil, you've been traveling the world. But, well, and, yeah, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, which is a sort of about the methodology of prospective impact assessment as opposed to retrospective, which is what the REF is about. And that is in Science Foundation Ireland, they use a separate panel for impact assessment. So they'll only put forward major grants that have been assessed academically as superb into the next hopper before they finally get approval, which is an impact assessment. But that's a totally different non-academic international panel and Mark Ferguson, the head of the agency, says it's really great to see how those people really get into the detail of the research. They, they really understand it, but they're looking at, a, at it from a much more a critically minded point of view. Yeah, you say impact, yes, you can set up a company with this sort of thing potentially, but actually this one gives you that particular sort of a part. That one doesn't. So that's the one to go for. So I just mentioned that for what it's worth. Thank you. Uh, question at the back and then a question over at the side. Hello. Um... My name is Angela. I've just um, in the process of completing a um, clinical neuroscience program. I'd like to agree with China. I think this is really, really good. 
um, I found it very exciting. Unfortunately, I've also found it quite challenging as well. Um, there's two reasons why I find it challenging, and I try and be very quick. Um, the first reason is that I'm not quite sure actually how you actually measure impact. Is impact actually something a criteria, a standard criteria, or is it actually something that is tailor made to the scientific um, um, realm or genre or something like that? So, for example, um, I, as a student, I worked for um, a dementia charity, and one of my roles was to take academic. Um, journals and then write them in layperson's terms so they could actually be put onto the um, website of that um, organization and um, impact was measured not only by academics but also when grants came in um, people who suffered from dementia or helped people with dementia actually were on that um, panel so that's i'm just wondering is it always ac academics and very um, high and esteemed people like yourself so i feel humbled saying the next thing but i have to say it i feel very very disturbed once again that i look around and i am the only person although i have a privileged background i'm the only person who is actually black and i'm just wondering we have lovely esteemed people there fortunately we have one woman i have actually been to organizations where we've had a panel of six lovely very middle class white men um so i'm just wondering also what you're doing about that are you making inclusive is this impact just another kind of um wonderful thing that we're just having jobs for the boys I, um, I did notice uh, when we were coming in that David and I seem to be the only people wearing ties around here as well. <laughs> um, so I, I am conscious of the, the, the point that you're making. So David, I mean, the, 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 the funding council actually, there's, there's two things here. One is is, is the, the funding council's work on, on um, uh, well, a whole range of aspects of, 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 of uh, around um, different categories of, of, of researchers and, and, and making sure that there's balance in, in, in there. The other is the question about who is doing the, the assessment and uh, you're pointing towards the role of, 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 of uh, non-academic colleges. Yes, uh, well, first point, we don't have a, con uh, a consensus view on how you assess impact. We've got a consensus view on how we assess academic excellence, not, I think, social impact. We've set out some ideas as as part of our exercise, essentially around reach and significance. Uh, one, and that has been discussed by, well, literally thousands of people in developing our panel guidelines. It's not the last word. One of the reasons, another reason for publishing the case studies and analyze them is to look at how better we can understand impact and how we can better assess it. So reach and significance for now, uh, some way to go. Uh, the panels that assess it for us, and I've got to say that uh, I have played no part in the assessment, I just run the exercise. I've, uh, in fact, not been to a single panel uh, meeting where assessment has taken place. Uh, it's done by uh, roughly half in half academics and those who are using research. So uh, for science, that often is business and industry and health, it's clinical uh, people, and it's also pharma country, uh, country companies, so we're into patient care and uh, obviously uh, uh, drug development. Uh, in, uh, in the humanities, it's often people in the media, uh, people who are involved in policy and government and want to, to use research. Basically, anybody who was nominated by a, a subject or other community, but not by universities, uh, who uh, is either doing research or using research. The diversity problem is just an enormous problem for science and research as a whole. The thing we've done this time is introduce a wide range of special circumstances that uh, ease the requirement for people to produce outputs. Uh, we will see when we publish our analysis whether uh, that has led to people who can produce the full output receiving, uh, uh, receiving the same recognition and credit as those who do not declare special circumstances, I'm optimistic that we'll find that uh, the special circumstances criteria have, have encouraged that. But, you know, we're, we're scratching at the problem in higher education as a whole, and particularly in research of uh, those issues. Uh, I think also it's about teamwork. Uh, 
in the tweets, Jonathan Ted says universities need to properly support interdisciplinary multi-author research. Red can hamper this. Well, I'm now going to reveal something for the first time that I probably shouldn't reveal, which Jonathan has just whispered in my ear. 70% uh, of the impact case studies involve interdisciplinary work. We have run this bit of an exercise precisely to recognize and reward that. Now, I, I'm not again <coughs> suggesting we solve that problem, but I do believe that in research assessment, uh, as in research funding, we've got to take that ever so seriously and learn how to do it better. And of course, that statistic that David revealed must immediately be forgotten. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, yeah. I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to, to make a, a point about the, the diversity uh, issue. I mean, I think in some ways impact can be helpful in that way. We do have a very significant problem on that in, in higher education, but actually, um, if you, when we were doing our research, some of the most impactful work would actually, for example, from very junior scholars that wouldn't in traditional academic impact, they did, hadn't had long years worth of careers to build up citations. They hadn't received a huge amount of research funding. You know, they weren't running research groups, but they were working very closely with external partners and really co-producing research, doing some really interesting work and therefore having a lot of impact. And I think that um, is enabling value to be given to a wider range of academics than some of the more traditional assessment um, measures were being able to. And again, that will be fascinating to see um, how many of the impact case studies actually weren't, you know, the big beasts um, from, um, from academia of the very, very senior profs and that we all kind of probably would know who they're going to be. And to see how much of it is research that's coming from different scholars, um, but are having real impact, real social impact. Just very quickly, I was, I was talking to a so this is about the question about the black relevance and interest. So this is just an anecdote. Um, I was talking to a professor at Berkeley who's in the social sciences, and she and her students were having a discussion about the incarceration system and its role in society in America. And what emerged in the conversation was a, a, apparently a unanimous view from the black students in the class that in the trajectory of the life of, of different population groups in the United States, mental health and mental illness is an excuse that black prisoners don't get to get. So there's a sort of an extraordinary per perception coming out of those students about the fact that in prison there are loads of mentally ill people who probably shouldn't be there, but the way it's seen by different social groups is different. And, you know, it's just an anecdote, but if you're trying to frame a whole set of research agendas and you don't take that sort of perspective into account, boy, are you going to miss the potential impact of your research? Thank you. We're very tight on time. <clears throat> I'm just going to take one last question because the questioners had their hand up since the beginning. Okay, yeah. Um, it strikes me that we're overlooking one very important part of impact in that a lot of the money that's used to fund research is spent employing students as PhDs or postdoctoral researchers. And a lot of these people don't remain in the academic world. They go into work in industry and in many ways become customers for the research that's produced. And I think, you know, and if, if we believe that, you know, having a high tech innovation future is the way forward, we're going to need a very high tech workforce and the way that, that that will be full of people who have done PhDs and postdocs in universities been paid for, for with government money but we're not capturing or measuring that as the impact of our investment in research. I, I disagree with you. I think we are capturing the impact of that. It is a huge, huge social impact of, of the research base. And, and I possibly the, the, the most important one. I, I should I, say, I, I listened, I thought of this right at the start, and yeah. I don't think a single speaker has mentioned that. Okay, the, this, the well, human it, angle it, of it. It, it. Quite simply, is captured in the red assessment. Uh, we count them. Uh, and they certainly could also feature in red case studies. I don't know whether they, they do or not. I think I should also say, actually, this is one area where Although there is a good bit of public funding that goes into uh, PhD students, actually lots of the funding doesn't come from the public purse. 
uh, and we need more funding for more PhD students. Uh, and I think there's a limited prospect of getting more public funding because of the, the, the competition. We all ought to be looking uh, to encourage folk to invest in the next generation of researchers, not just to refresh uh, the academic base in universities, but to do precisely what you say, to get out there and take a rigorous understanding of how to do research and how to use research in not just the business industry, but into the, uh, the rest of the world. We need more students studying at doctoral level, and it's one of the, the problems. We can't afford it out of the public purse, so we've all got to look for all kinds of donation and other funding uh, so that we have more, uh, more students uh, studying at doctoral level. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, I don't want to keep plugging Science Foundation Ireland and the Chief Scientist of Ireland, but he does seem to have interesting views about some of these things. And he was giving an example of how really bad Ireland and we and many others are at tracking what happens to the graduates and the, the postgraduates who leave university and go into society. But he said the Danes have cracked it, they got a brilliant data set because they use their inland revenue service to track everybody and their tax returns and they just follow them through their lives so they know exactly where everybody is and so they're able to provide the data of exactly the sort that one might want so i just again offer that for what it's worth <laughs> thank you very much uh, for your questions i uh, we obviously from a number of hands are up we've gone for some while thank you very much to the panel for a, a very diverse extremely uh, stimulating discussion to round off the day um, and thank you all for, for being here as well thank you Thank you for a really fascinating last session. Um, thank you, everybody, for your contributions today. I'd like to thank all of our speakers and all of you. Um, I'd also like to um, thank Rowena and Nicole for their efforts on the live streaming and the microphones. It's really made sure that we can have a truly inclusive discussion, um, including people sending us questions on Twitter, which is great. Um, so that's it for today. Please don't forget about the unconference if you're joining us tomorrow. Um, if you've put suggestions in the Google Doc, please do add them to the board before you leave today. And also final reminders that there is a science show off tonight at seven o'clock, Star of Kings. Tickets are available on the door, although I suspect you probably want to um, get there fast. And we'll kick off at nine o'clock tomorrow with coffee and the unconference sessions begin at 9.30. So thanks very much. See you tomorrow. I think you can get to the books in this bookshop. They're fantastic. I've given them yesterday. And some of them are just straightforward academic books. But there's got a whole set of books all about informatics. So they just show data in the most brilliant.